Welcome to the lighter side of the dark side. It's your weekly freak show here on Renegade Radio, all podcast catchers and YouTube. I'm Dark Mark, the goth comedian. It's Grammy week this week, and I am here as always with my co-host, everybody's favorite horror writer, Nicole Six. Hello. We've got so many Grammy winners on this week. I know, it's exciting. And uh, the, uh, the Grammy winners we have on tonight, uh, one of them has been a guest on the show before. We talked for an hour and a half, and I've still got more questions for her. Uh, that's uh, Lily Hayden, who's, Hi. Uh, whose uh, uh, album "More Love" is uh, is is still listable. Please go check it out; it's fantastic. But she's here uh, with uh, her compatriots in her band, Grammy-winning band, Opium Moon. Hi, Hi Lily. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hey. And there's one more member of the band who couldn't be with us this Yes, I, I was going to mention you. Uh, 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 Lily's uh, other half and bass player of Opium Moon uh, and very accomplished musician in his own right, uh, Itai Disraeli. If I, I hope I pronounced that right. You pronounced it perfectly. Thank you, Mark. And we also have somebody that Lily's not married to, but she is married oh, to yeah. him musically. <laughs> the drummer of Opium Moon. It's M.B. Gordy. How are you? I'm married to him. That that's our marriage. <laughs> oh, you, I didn't know you guys had such an open marriage. I'm not sure what's going on over there in Opium Moon. Just for rhythm section stuff, you know. That's right. That's right. We're going to talk about that. And um, and uh, thank you all for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having us. No, I I I I, uh, I was listening to the new album that's coming out shortly, and uh, I've got I really like it, and there's I've got a lot of questions. Um, first, but before we get started, um, I got to keep my energy up with you guys. So I've got my raise energy drinks. These are the best, uh, zero carbs, zero calories, zero crash. This is the Baja Lime. You can get a case of this or any flavor that you want. There's a description underneath in any podcast catch or YouTube, 15% off. Awesome. You can also go to audible and listen to audio books for free on me. Go to audibletrial.com forward slash DMS, audibletrial.com forward slash DMS, free audiobook, free 30-day trial to Audible and access to all Audible originals. And Nicole, we'll, we will get to our other sponsor a little later, but uh, I know that uh, they're the reason you'll be so talkative today, so that's uh, <laughs> going to be good. Uh, Lily, I actually have a couple more questions I have to ask you before we get to the whole band. Okay. Now, More Love's been out for a, for a while. I, it came out in March, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you uh, happy with the way it's doing? I know I've, I've heard More Love the song a few places that I didn't, didn't expect it. Well, that's nice to hear. Uh, you know, I, my mom used to say the only thing is, that's fair is between you and the creation. So I give it my all, and then I give it into the world. And then, you know, it's going well. I've gotten a lot of nice radio play and stuff like that. But... Uh, you know, it's really, for me, it's about always creating new stuff. And, uh, and I'm just super psyched about the Opium Moon record, which is coming out August 27th. As, as am I. But uh, as far as the critics and the fans, their reaction, are you happy with that? Uh, sorry, say that one more time. The critics and the fans that were waiting for a Lily solo album, they must love it. People have been very enthusiastic, which is really nice. And what's nice for me is also that the album was made uh, with, it was, it was with the intent to integrate both my singer songwriter, you know, artist personality with my identity as a film composer. Um, and so these were very cinematic tracks and, uh, and, you know, as is the OP moon record. So really it's kind of just turning our attention toward uh, putting music in television and film, uh, which is really where we all live and have been making, it's kind of like the last bastion of where you can actually make a living in the music business in a way. So, uh, right. so that's, uh, yeah, it's been, people have been receptive to it and uh, just uh, excited to be into bringing it to OP and moon. I know you're with you're with the guys. You got to talk about opium. I, I understand. I just I and I I, I did. I will try to uh, slip in the uh, is there a glass ceiling for female scorers a little later. But um, you worked on the Tom Petty soundtrack album. She's the one. Yeah. They just re-released it, but they took you out. Did they? I didn't notice that. Yeah, I, I think I, I think I don't know. I didn't hear any violin on it, and I was looking at the uh, 
like you know the they have like who's played on the album i think they took you out i'll have to kick some ass over that i think so well how was it working with him uh, i was amazing uh you know i sort of i didn't grow up in rock and roll so i uh it was everybody i you know got to work with i didn't realize how cool it was until other people started telling me it was cool um so uh, that was a blast but uh you know, it, it, it's an honor to just work with anybody. And, you know, we, uh, I, MB, didn't you work with Tom Petty as no. well? No. Um, but that, that whole elk of uh, kind of, we, we've all played for, uh, for some amazing artists. And, right. uh, you know, it just informs what we do moving forward. So, um, and, yeah. Uh, and now you're at Open Moon. We were talking to MB before the show about all the soundtracks he's been on. Uh, uh, and uh, just, I mean, just he just a laundry list of every every movie that we've uh, ever seen in the last ten years. Pretty yeah. much. If you've done a movie in the last ten years, you've heard MB. <laughs> and it, <laughs> once, a lot, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> and you know, and he just he just did a session with uh, a big pop star that uh, I don't know if we're gonna make, remain nameless, but uh, no, very interesting. Actually, posted all about it, but then we weren't supposed to. Uh, right. Well, if it's been posted, then it's free game, right? So can we just say? Yeah, you know, they made us. We're all believers. Let's just put it that way. You How know? about you don't say it, but I do. Yeah, fine. You can say it. <laughs> okay. He just played for Adele. That too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And be that's, that's something to look forward to. I can, uh, the way you play drums and the way Adele sings, I can see that coming together if, it, if, it, if it's done right. I'm actually playing for both of those uh, tracks, the Adele record, I'm playing timpani on those two cuts that I played on, and on the Justin Bieber thing, it was timpani and concert bass drum. It was orchestral stuff, you know. So, and the Buble thing, that was all timpani. Everything was timpani on that stuff. So, this begs the question because obviously Lily's done a lot of sessions, and he I, 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 and I don't know as much about your. I know you played on, but it seems like you have more of a jazz background. Well, I have very eclectic background because you know i have a lot of uh, both middle eastern jazz classical reggae uh indian influences which i'll put in my own little cauldron and cook it for you know the way i play i have um a kind of a of, how would you define the guitar like uh, it's more like a he has a band with his brother that's awesome and kicks ass and it's kind of Middle Eastern jazz and funk and uh, yeah. it's groovy and melodic and impressionistic and like like tickles the eardrums in a way that you wouldn't expect. And he brought a lot of that magic uh, to Opium Moon as well. And we're kind of like sister bands in a way. Right. So and I, uh, I sort of uh, I sort of jumped the gun. I don't know if everybody knows what everybody does, but Lily is a, a violin player extraordinary. She's played on everything. Uh, and we went we went through a laundry list last time you were on the show, but you play with every every rock star. You've been a violin player since since you were seven. Etai plays fretless bass and uh, he's from Israel. And is a and, composer, multi instrumentalist, arranger. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, please educate me. Yeah, so well again, the main thing is that I think What's so interesting about Open Moon is that we really bring all of our influences and all this stuff and put it together. So it's really more how do we take all these influences and everything we know and put it in that, you know, the thing that make our music. That's the real magic to me more than because I know I played in big bands. I played da 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 da. da. It's all the question is what is it doing now? Because all that stuff is you know, we've done it. We, you know, these are notes already in the air and kind of out in the universe. The new notes is is what's interesting. Okay. And but also be, how they find their way, you know, how they express themselves. So, yeah, we've got, you know, we've got a little bit of Adele. We've got a little bit of Tom Petty. We've got a little bit of, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean. We've got a little bit of, uh, you know, his his uh, period, time in Israel. I mean, his, you know, his background in Israel. We've got uh, Hamid Saidi, our beautiful Santour player, um, right. is uh, from Iran. And we what we're doing is we're bringing everything that we've ever heard played, felt, imagined, and we're bringing it to the table and throwing it up in the air like fairy dust and the way it lands and blends with each other's fairy dust is what is exciting about it because it's that the sum of the parts is greater than, or the, the, the result is bigger than the sum of the parts. Um, and we, 
uh, and it's just simply magic when we get together. So we have a theme around which we create a new concoction, and uh, it's all it's it's so exciting to be making this music with with these exquisite musicians. It's like a new stew every time, every piece. Yeah. Right. And if you think about, you know, if you look at the human head, you will notice right away that we have two years and only one month. And I think that's like a subtle hint. We have to listen maybe at least twice as much as we speak. You know? <laughs> so right, that's, right. that's one thing that we do in a band. We really like concentrate on listening deeply because everybody in the band is virtual. So and everybody in the band could put a solo concert by themselves and you would miss nothing, you know? But the whole idea is how do we take all this? And instead of being me, 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 it's more like how do we make it a, a one thing that's kind of us? And that's the challenge and that's the, uh, the joy really in what we're doing. And right. I think the results kind of speak for themselves because the, I think the music has really a timeless quality about it. It's not, it cannot really even be pegged so much. It's this, it's this, it's really soul music, if you will. It's a spiritual soul music, really. Right, it, is, it does defy classification. Uh, and our favorite, my favorite review uh, from one of the fans on Amazon was that we're world music from another world. Hmm. That's good. Yeah, I'll take that. That's good. And it's a world where people from uh, all different cultures can get along. Yes, yeah. exactly. Think about yeah. it. They're trying, to, they're trying to beat the drums of war, say, with Israel and Iran. And Hamid and myself are coming and saying, no, 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 that we have peace between us. You know, there is dialogue, there is connection, there is heart, you know? Right. And so I think that's another thing that we want to send to the world is that, that we, by the way we are with each other and the way we play with each other, it's kind of a blueprint, if you will, for, for peace. Right. And, you know. And also, ahead, uh, MB is a dog person and I'm a cat person. And we are... We oh. <laughs> Nicole's a cat person. I am a cat person. Sorry, so we're making peace on all levels. <laughs> if cats and dogs can get along, animals all over the earth will be listening to Opium Moon. That's right. <laughs> if cats and dogs can get along, Israelis and Iranians can get along, yeah. Americans and Canadians can get along, I don't everything. <laughs> we'll try. <laughs> yeah, so, so here's the question I've been uh, meaning to ask, and I've been kind of, uh, uh, where did you two meet? You, Lily, and you, Itai, because this is not just a musical collaboration. It's, it's a love collaboration. It is. It is. It's a good, it's story. It's a good story how we met, actually. Uh, you know what she said about you last time she was on the show, Itai? What did she say about me? Whatever she said, you know. She said uh, that she, if she was with another guy, you're the guy she'd want to cheat on. But. She did say that to me. Look, I, I feel myself <laughs> every day when I wake up in the morning, I kiss I kiss my lucky stars for this wonderful, wonderful, um, incredible human being that I get to share life with, you know? My, my beloved Lily, who is an incredible human being, musician, uh, friend, lover, everything you will, visionary. You know, so it's, it's, I feel very blessed that, you know, we have this- um, And I do too, and how did we meet, baby? How do we meet? <laughs> it's actually a good story. See, Nicole, if we keep going like this, they'll start kissing and then, Hey, you don't know what we're doing under the under the part you don't see right now. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine. The story was a good story. I actually, at the time, you know, the, the, my band is called Maytar, you know, my, my, my brother and my and my manager was like, go play this show. And I was like, I don't want to go play this show. That's not going to, he's going to go play this show. And I was actually supposed to have a gig with her band somewhere else that got canceled. And I didn't know her at the time. Anyway, I, he forced me to go do this gig, you know, and I was like, all right. And I went, I played this gig, and her band came there. And um, the first thing she said to me, <laughs> do you have a nine volt battery for my Wawa pedal? And I was like, anybody that can approach me with a first question like this, you know, and he's a musician, it's gotta be cool, you know? <laughs> so, and then she, she, we were selling some band shirts. So she wanted like the, the baby blue shirt. I, I asked for a one. child's shirt because I, I'm petite <laughs> and I was hoping he would just give me one, but I was flirting. Anyway, we, we, uh, we were busting other people at the time, but what, as soon as I got single, I, I called him immediately and uh, let him know that I was, uh, you know, I was available. And I just <laughs> I came over and, you know, we, the first thing we did is we just kissed and never stopped since then, you know? Yeah, almost 15 years later. Wow, that's great. So, I mean, when you guys are in the studio, uh, do you guys got to wait for these guys to settle down before you start, like, uh, doing work or what? Are they, are they, are, when you're doing their drums, are they in the corner off 
doing stuff and getting flirty and getting. <clears throat> you're muted. Oh, you're muted, more Emmy. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm off in the corner by myself. Uh, um, uh, nice for me. <laughs> it's, always, it's always cool, you know. Whatever it works out. And um, no, we get down to business, man. You know, like we we uh, we kind of come in, and know what we want to do. Well, the, the irony is that that first record, the the one that won the Grammy, we recorded at my studio as like a the first one anyway was like as like a rehearsal, and. Right. We was like, we were like, oh wow, okay, this is cool. Let's do this again. So then we recorded again. I, I remember how many times it was three. I don't remember the total amount of times, but all of a sudden we had a record then, and that's what it ended up being. And then many mixes later, but uh, but it, it, that ended up being the record that was recorded here at my house or at my studio, not my house, but my studio. And um, and uh, this new record we did differently, but uh, well, a little bit differently, <clears throat> but. Um, but uh, no, it was just, that one was just kind of like this weird thing. We came in with ideas, everybody, you know, like whatever. And then we just, oh, let's do this. And let's do that. And let's play and let's record. And so it just evolved and it was pretty cool, you know. And well, how did you guys, how did you end up hooking up with uh, Lily and Itai and uh, Amidi? Well, I've actually known Lily lo longer than Itai has. <laughs> so that's. A... <laughs> you guys have done some soundtracks together, I assume? Uh, we played on a bunch of stuff. I was playing a gig with this guy who knew Lily's mom, and Lily came into the gig that I was playing, and that was the first time I met her. And I'm forgetting it was back in the '80s, and uh, I no. in the '80s because they weren't dating then, and I was a child. Uh, but uh, but in the '90s, uh, uh, MB was playing with uh, an artist that my mom was actually dating, um, although uh, he never like really acknowledged. My mom was a beautiful stand-up comedian and Lotus writer uh, named Lotus Weinstock, who was the first woman to perform at the Comedy Store and also wrote songs that Richie Havens and Tim Harden covered. Um, and she had a, um, a, a penchant for misunderstood geniuses who hated her for understanding them. Uh, and uh, and uh, David Zasloff was the artist and uh, that she was dating. and. Uh, he never really acknowledged them as a couple until, except my mom said, I'm so excited. Uh, he finally acknowledged us as a couple. He said, I want to break up with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, anyway, he was kind of a schmuck to her, but uh, it brought MB, MB and I got to know each other um, a little bit. And I got to hear her play. It was that, so that's the first time I met her. Fast forward many years later, she and I were doing a rehearsal, and I just, I, for this composer who was putting up, I had played on his movie, this guy, Marco Beltrami, and he did the music for uh, 310 to Zuma, which I actually played on. In fact, that was the first big movie score I ever did in my studio. Right. Um, so he was doing a live version, like a concert version of that. that mm -hmm. So we were, she, he brought Lily in, he brought me in, and all these people. And I said, well, look, you know, like, I'm closer. He's got this awesome studio way out in Malibu, but it was like, hello, way too far to drive for that, for everybody. So I said, look, why don't we uh, rehearse at my house? It's more centrally located. Lily comes in, and she goes, hey, I got this project. You know, great to see you, blah, blah, blah. It's been forever. I got this project, and um, I think you'd, you'd love this. And I said, well, let's get together and let's see and then that's that's how that went the other weird part about how that whole thing was we get together at my studio i don't know the next week or whenever it was so yeah. in walks lily and walks a tie in walks hami i don't recognize him however unbeknownst to, well at, at the time when she was telling me about him i played with him the year before the the that was summertime yeah the christmas before that at a gig in florida and I remember him because when he he comes in and he sits down, we all set up. He starts playing, and I like, and I'm like freaking out. Like I didn't recognize him visually. I recognized his playing. And that same thing happened the night that I played with him for the first time ever. Was we just got thrown together in this band, and I come in, sit down. I've got my friend. I forget what I was playing. Dumbeck and Cajon and whatever. And he sits next to me, and he starts playing, and I'm like, what the is this man i'm like freaking out so i remember his playing so when he was playing we, i said stop, stop wait a minute did you play this gig like and he, and he goes yeah i said 
dude, I sat next to you and played next to you at that gig. And we were like, oh, my God. It was like, so this weird thing. And it was like, that. that's really out. You know, like all this time later. And we're in Florida, whatever. So that's that's how that went. So Lily kind of pulled the whole thing. And she had, I don't know, how, Lily, how'd you meet Hami? I forget. You know what? The Angels gave us this uh, music. I, I mean, yeah, there are ways that this all happened, but literally it just, it's like the Angels wanted this group to happen. Every single step of the way has been like, okay, this is the idea. Okay, Hamid, we, uh, Itai and I heard him play and we're like, oh my God, this guy is insanely beautiful. We have to do a record with him. And we just, and the second I saw MB's name, it was like the Angels said, uh, that's your percussion. That's the guy who's got to play drums in the band. Uh, and it just was like, it, it was not even a question. Every single melody has been given, every single, uh, like, call this person, put it out with this person. Honestly, it sounds very fairy and a little creepy even, but it's uh, it's actually true. This, this music has been given to us, and we just, it's like, it's a gift that we get to play, and we just... I personally am in love with it, and it's it's a gift to be able to share it, honestly. And I, and I say it without reservation. It's harder to talk about my solo stuff with in such grand terms, but this right. stuff is this is just it's a collaboration. It's it's a heavenly collaboration. Yeah, I don't I don't usually brag a whole lot about anything I'm doing, um, but this new record is freaking insane. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> And, and Hamid plays the 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 santor, is it? Santor. It's a, a Persian hammered dulcimer. And it's uh, it makes a very unique. Sound. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm saying it's kind of like if you took a piano and ripped out the the, 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 the guts, the guts, and play them with 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 tiny little with hammers. Tiny little hammers, and each string. Yeah, I know. I've I've seen it. It's uh, it's a trip. It's yeah. very impressive. I mean, it's I mean the precision he has to have to hit those notes. You, the yeah. From the new record, he's doing some stuff you like. You're not going to believe that even is doable. Well, know? I think I, I sent you a link, right? So you yes, you did. Yeah. Oh, I, I've got some songs. Uh, yeah. I uh, I've got some favorites. Okay, oh. which are your favorites? It, 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 it. Take a wild guess. Uh -huh. uh, Feast of Sevens. I like that one. I'll wait for you is my favorite. Ah. All right. Okay. Right That's on. very sensual. Nicole, next time. Uh, Next time you're, because uh, I don't know when that's going to happen for me, but, but next time you're over intimate with a man, uh, put on I'll Wait For You. I think it's going to prolong the mood. <laughs> now, this whole album actually is very, we actually, the funny thing is, and are we allowed to swear on this show? Oh, we encourage it. Okay. And well, I know then, what you're going to say, too. So, so the concept is basically the first album was this, all this beautiful, meditative, glorious stuff. And uh, we love that. I mean, we, you know, it, you put it, you make it, it's very sexy and it's sensual and it turns into this hypnotic spell. But we also love to make people get up and shake their asses and dance. And uh, mm -hmm. so we decided to put all the meditative making love stuff on one album and all the danceable stuff on the other. So the album is called Night and Day, Opium Moon, Night and Day. Uh, we wanted to call it Dancing and Fucking, but we thought it might be a little on the nose. Um, <laughs> Sounds like a Two Life Crew album too. So that's not quite, that, I don't know if that's going to work. Exactly. So yes. But, uh, no, no, no. I, I, I get, I get why. Yeah. <laughs> so just put on the fucking record, and you'll have a, you know. And then by the time the the day record comes on, the danceable stuff, it'll be time to really get the, you know, get that four on the floor pumping going. Exactly. So, no, exactly. Yeah. Or you can slow, slow and then it's hard. And then chill. I mean, it's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's slow and it's hard. But Emmy, before we got before we got on this uh, this. Uh, Central side trip. I was going to say, as a percussionist yourself, when you see uh, when you see Hamid doing what he's doing, I mean, how difficult is that? I mean, you must know better than anybody. Well, I don't know if I know better than anybody, but I know it's freaking hard because <laughs> I play him. I play I play a little hammer dulcimer. I actually have two, and uh, I'm not going to touch him after I hear Hamid play. <laughs> so. it's I can like I can like look at the notes like look okay, what is that note and I can go dig and play these little patterns that's about it but uh, no nah, he's he is ridiculous man it's 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 over the top what this guy can do on on that instrument and go ahead tunable like and he can tune it as he goes I mean he can change pitches I should say I mean it's not not he, he 
you can't get really crazy with that because he's got to take the time to flip a little uh, lever. But it's he can do it, and it's and he does it sometimes when we're playing, and it's really wild, man. So, but you're, you're no slouch so, yourself. No, I mean, I've, I've seen some. Uh, I mean, when when people when I say drums, people, are, I'm not talking like. Uh, I'm sorry, Nicole. You got uh, when what? I say drum when I say drums. Uh, this guy, it's not like he's on a kid doing. Uh, Doing uh, John Bonham fells. You're on like you're doing the uh, almost bongo y sort of stuff on on uh, on, on really as as we found out expensive and uh, big drums. Yeah, I play a lot of drum set, but I mean this band is strictly at this point anyway is strictly hand drum stuff. Like I, I'll use this this sort of well when we played in India I used a sort of a, a cajon that I sat on which I usually use anyway and a djembe and a, some frame drums and a, doom, a couple different dumbbells and um, then I also use this kick pedal with a reverse pedal on the on the um, on the cajon so that's pretty cool hold on just one second let me show the door so anyway uh, uh, shut that door. Um, so, but what we were using before that was this thing called a porch kick, but the cajon kicks actually sounds a little bit better. So, and what's but, the huge drum like? I, I don't know if it was your TED talk or some video I saw. You were just playing this huge drum, and you just had it running yourself. Oh, that's the frame drum. That's the that's a big frame drum. It's twenty. I think it's twenty six or twenty eight inch frame drum. Itai's got one too. And um, then we added. When I did this tour a couple years ago, uh, the Game of Thrones live tour on, in 2018, I got this thing called a table drum. And it's like a, <laughs> it's basically a, a, a frame drum on steroids, but it's you can play with sticks and mallets and stuff. And so I pulled that out on this new record and they were like, whoa, what's that? So like now we add that on a lot of tunes and you can play with your hands or brushes. I do one tune where I play brushes with, with brooms actually. And uh, so that's kind of cool, you know. Something, something that sounds awesome. awesome. You need to know about MB that he won't tell you, but we know. And that's one of the reasons we love coming to to record his place. MB's got this magical room that, like, it's got every drum you can think about and things you've never heard of, all kinds of, like, the most ridiculous percussion. I mean, it's like being, a, I love drums, you know. So, like, being, it's like being in a toy store if you're a kid that's crazy about drums, but not your regular drums, everything you can imagine. And MB is a master of pulling tones out of drums that, you know, you, you, you take the drum and you sound like poop, and then B will take it and start singing like this whole, you know, not only that, I mean, be between B and myself, the, the, the rhythmic lock and the freedom of groove that we have between us, because we never talk about what we're going to do. We never right. tell each other what we, we just just fall into it. Yeah. And it's really, look, I've played with great, many great drummers, but the B, the, the natural lock, the natural groove that we have, is so easy. I think you can hear on the opium moon music how the everybody in the music is very strong rhythmically. I mean, I mean, everybody's got their percussion side, but what we do is we both combine the percussiveness and the fluidity of the kind of be able to get it, and that and the sound of the fretless bass and the frame drum. I think is one of the trademark opium moon sound. It kind of and the certain way that we tune the drum to go with the bass. It's a whole science stuff that we work on it. Yeah, you know, that just sounds like ancient to the future kind of, you know, mystical thing. So that's, that's the biggest thing as a rhythm section player, as a drummer, and then as a bass player. Right. Our job is to keep the time. I mean, end of story. I mean, in reality, that's a misnomer because it's everybody's job to keep the time. But we hold it down. And if you don't have that foundation, then at the end of the day, nothing's going to really gel correctly. Now, right. That said, it's everybody else's job to have good time too because you we could be locking, but if you know if the other members of the band are not kind of I don't know their concept of time is whatever different than yours, um, it's not gonna it's it you're gonna I think the, the average audience wouldn't necessarily be able to go hmm well they're they're not grooving they wouldn't know that necessarily but they can feel that something's not right right. And actually, also, I uh, for me, you know, this band, the, the the concept of Opium Moon, really, to me, the, the first inkling of it came from just falling in love with Hamid's sound. And uh, and I was just, I was had, like, gotten fed up with the rock and roll, you know, world of overproduced shows and stuff. And I was like, just 
please, I'm just in love with this sound. Please, let's just you and I get together. It was just, it was Santour and violin and it was absolutely exquisite, but it was this kind of like beautiful thing that didn't, it was kind of like a little airy fairy, uh, but the two, but MB and Itai get down and it makes you want to fuck. It just <laughs> does. And it's I'll like, wait for you, case uh, in point. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. the fact that, that they can do that, and that we get to be this kind of like beautiful, sensual, like, you know, mellifluous, like, you kind of like, we just this magical kind of fairy dust world with uh, this driving, libidinous thing, the sexy thing happening that just chugs along and makes you like make the funky face, uh, the combination of that, the fact right. that it's done live and that we're all using our, you know, our wits and we don't know where it's going to go. And the, the concept of the danger and the unknown, that to me is what is so much fun about playing and also listening back because it's not like a typical, you know, a typical record where you can predict where it's going to go. I just never like what's even, you know, three years later, our first album, I still hear new things, you know, it tickles right. the eardrums in a way that, uh, that I think for me, and especially, you know, musicians that I, it's like, we're so jaded, there's so much saturation in the marketplace, you know, I, I just love being like seduced by this music, because I, you, it's like that that concept of play. You don't know where it's going to go, but yet it's simple. There's space, but it's still that concept of, of the unknown. But you, but you know you're going to follow, follow with your violin. Well, you're gonna, no. we're all going to follow it. We're just going to, you know, uh, we also have, um, you know, some vocals on this record as well, which is fun to sing along with. No. The, the other thing is also, I think we, we are breaking the boundaries. There's not, even though me and B, we do think rhythm section, we actually don't think in this band there's a rhythm section as front people. Oh. It's really more like a spear, you know? And so, for instance. Well, um, you're, not doing a, you're not doing a four, strict 4-4. Four, four, like not strict 4-4. Four, four, <laughs> and, and also there's no, even though we have structures and we have melodies and we have kind of anchor points, the idea is how free can we dance together? And also, how how um, uh, how how we can bring mel melodies and beauty to the world. So, for instance, for me, as a bass player, there's a world of the support that the bass is doing, you know. But I'm a, a composer, and I have a, a certain attitude stuff. So I feel great being able to support everything, and then play beautiful melodies. Yeah, I can run all over the other, but the thing is that, like, just you know, like when Santana plays a song and you can um, a solo and you can sing it. You know, yeah. or you know, okay. David Gilmore, like the the, the the guitars they play solos so you can sing afterwards. Sure. And they're like, if they don't play in the show, people get mad because that solo is so much part of the song stuff. Right. That's the kind of solos that I personally like to play. So for me, I'd like to play less and say more when I'm soloing. But the thing that's so nice with this band is that everybody, so it's it's like it's like interweaving. It's not well, it's, this one's going to solo. It's more like. Yeah, the it's fluidity. So naturally. Yeah, it's really for us about the fluidity and the freedom and the unknown. Because uh, we all have our own, we got our tricks, you know, we've been around long enough to know, you know, know what to do. And we've done it with a lot of different people. You know, it's like a bunch of, uh, I don't all know. All different styles of music. Yeah, we've, but, but, but the beauty is we just, we kind of leave it all at the door and it just sort of, we offer, it's like this. It's like slow motion seduction. It's really, it's now, really you, fun. I, I, you know, I, you know what I said about them, like you, maybe kissing in a minute. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but I was gonna say, now it, these, you guys are incorrigible. But um, what I was gonna say is, uh, listening to the new album, when you started this three, three, four years ago, did you anticipate it going in this musical direction or no? Oh, kind of. I mean, you know, I mean, it's grown. But, and it's actually been five years this July, by the okay. way. So, well, this, this album is really, it's a continuation of, the, it's kind of like the, this one and these, they have to kind of be looked at, at the, you know, the first, the first chapter of Opium Moon is like, you know, because this right. old material that was part of our, it wasn't written, some of it was written for this record, but, but it was, some of it is material that was part of our repertoire for the first record. We just, it was not... Recorded. Recorded and that kind of stuff. So I would say this 
first record and these two are the, all, the, the original Opium Moon sound and concept. You really have to be, hear both of them to see the full thing, but yes. And it incorporates a lot of the stuff that we would do in our live shows. Yeah. Right. Thanks. So, the live show, by the way, is really different than the albums that we've done. The uh, live show, even early on, that first record was really sinuous and sensuous and that whole thing. Um, that's not only what we did live, right? right? I might point out that that first record was not done with a click track and our shows aren't done with a click track um, or track backing tracks or whatever. And um, this new record we did on the up stuff, we used the click track for because we knew we were going to be having to overdub stuff and whatnot. Well, but, uh, on, on the song Dream, which I really like too, uh, was there a drum machine in there too? No drum machine ever or nothing. Just really, that's but, but playing kick kick drum. But but we have done more production. But that kick drum was played. That was the the, the porch board. Yeah, it's a porch board. It's yeah. not. It's a, it's a board that's basically like. It's like as if you sit on your porch and stamp your foot. Okay. It's a piece of wood that you kind of stomp on. Kind and of. it gives you that kick. Like that that dance kick. But, but it's, 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 it's a great sound. No, there are no uh, drum machines. There's no loops. You know, there's might be a few like little percussion overdubs, but there's no, so everything you hear is live. And then this okay. is our attitude that I was about to say earlier. In That's some of our other configurations, I heard it. I'm playing with like 4 million effects, loops, blah, 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 then Lily's got nothing. It's here's how we set up. I plug in. <laughs> and B pulls out his drum, Lily takes out the violin, Hamid set up his tour, it's done. We are the quickest setup. We don't have enough time to make out because there's no time for setup. Yeah, you got to plug in. I understand. <laughs> but let me ask you a question seriously about bass. Um, ask away, man. A couple questions. First off, because uh, I almost every bass player I know is a frustrated guitarist. They just kind of fell into the bass because they wanted to be in a band. Is that your experience or no? Not really. I mean, I actually, in my first band, I played drums, piano, and guitar. And I had, so it's, it's a triple experience. I had three friends. And I want them okay. to be in the band. And I know that if I play any of those instruments, they will not be in the band. <laughs> so I, I, I and, and, and the guy that I like played bass, so I just picked it up and tried it, and then I just fell in love with it. Well, but the thing is, he kind of plays the whole orchestra with his bass. He's oh, no, played, I've heard it, yes. You know, the bass is just uh, a place from which he expresses himself. It's he, ex he would express himself with that same beautiful tone and groove on every instrument, and he does. And so okay. there's, you can hear the guitar playing in his playing, in his solos. You can hear his drumming and his his compositional prowess in the way he you know he, he plays as well. So uh, it's I think for all of us in a way we're we're all composers, we're all producers, we're all kind of macro. We we think on a macro level. So I you know the fact that I'm playing violin is. You know, it's incidental in a way. It's you know, it's just it's it's just a different manifestation of the same muse. So I'm thinking. I think part of the reason that that we're able to play so spaciously and 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 make room for each other is that we are we can you can we we can all kind of hear the finished product in a way and know that we you know that we should back off at this point and we need i need to hear from the centaur player i need to now hear the bass player right. sing out i need to hear him be you know passionately you know gesticulate and you know that we, we make room for each other because we can hear because we're we all have the big picture in mind and well, you definitely fill in each other's faces that's for sure and for the big picture in mind, you want to, to just finish that. So I think that the, the bigger question is this. I think that music comes first. So the way I like to think of myself and anyone that I work with, we are musicians first. The instrument we play is secondary. So in other words, a lot of times it's what I call the prison, the prison of the instrument. You know, you start playing instruments, you start thinking, like you start becoming, okay, I'm that and not that. And I think it's limiting because I'm, a, I'm an overall musician. So for me, I've always been an innovative bass player. I've done things in Israel on the bass as a kid that I've not heard anybody do, from tapping to da, 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 right. you know stuff that I came up with, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I think that it's more important to think about how you express the music through whatever you do. So that's more interesting to me because, you know, like I said, I'm a multi-instrumentist. I get sessions on a lot of different instruments. I do all the kinds of stuff. But as far as 
with, especially with Opium Moon, I think that, that my attitude is, well, it's, it's partially, it's interesting because it's based on something I call bass sitar, which is a combination of trying to get the concept of Indian music and sitar playing, the attitude of string playing on a sitar and put it on a fretless bass, which is kind of part of what I this yeah. was my main question. I just kind yeah. of threw that out there. Like the, all right, ask away. My main question was, you play fretless bass. What is the difference? And what kind of sounds you can, can you get by having it fretless than having frets on it? That's such a great question, Mark. Thank you for asking this. Well, well it's only taken 48 minutes for me to get one out. <laughs> you can start with that. We can have the whole 40 minutes to talk about this. Uh, basically, the, the, simple, the easiest way to think about it is this. Imagine with your voice that you had to, you had to go only go, ah, uh, ah. Uh, 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 uh. And then imagine you can go, uh. okay, so in a nutshell, that's one of the things that fretless instrument gives you. Western, Western theory, uh, Western music have actually set our notes in certain positions. They actually have out of tune. If you actually go down musically for real, they're out of tune. So when you play a string, instru a fretted instrument, you are locked to these positions and you can change them with bending and stuff like this. But your level of expression, like for instance, violins, cellos, because the neck is without frets, the multi, between each note is about 100 degrees. You know, so be able to really reach all these degrees and the nuance that comes with them and the emotion that comes with them is really only available on a fretless instrument. So in, however, if, when you play fretless instrument, you really have to be in tune. Because if you're not in tune, it sounds horrible. <laughs> so it gives, so some things you can do, like for instance, slap bass sounds like shit on fretless. I mean, right. it's, it's a, you can make it kind of conga stuff, but it's not really, you won't get the slap and you will destroy your bass. But as far as like, uh, and also chordal approach, because, you know, it's, it's harder to be more precise with the fretless. Yeah, his, the, welcome like, to the, my world. Like, violin yeah, but, you, but, but I like <laughs> big chords and stuff like this, but, and most bass players, you know the joke, do you know the bass player joke, right? I don't. Well, there's many, but one of them is like, the, the guy comes to a the bass teacher and the bass teacher goes, okay, today we're learning the E string. Okay, next week, bass player comes, we're going to learn the A string. Third week, the bass player doesn't show up. The teacher called him, where, where are you? He said, well, I got a gig. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm saying, so I think that the truth is this, the bass player, the real bass players, they are the center of the band. They are the guys who actually have to know the most, to be the most reliable, to be like really, if they're really good bass players and do their job. So by that nature, bass players learn to really kind of encompass a lot of things in them. And, 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 and if they're good, they kind of put it out in their own particular way. And, and if I may also, the fretless uh, is just way more expressive. I mean, it's, you know, you can play with frets, but, you know, it basically cuts off, you know, all of the degrees of uh, between the notes. Um, Welcome. What I love so much about Itai's playing is his tone and yeah. his expressiveness. It's so sensual and so, and I say this without you know, the fact that I'm married to him. Um, no, right. no, like, I noticed his tone from the very first time I heard him. She told me that the first um, time, so I, she's, she's not telling me. Um, I, I rec you know, and especially on Fretless. When I love everything he plays, but when I hear him on Fretless, it's like, that is your sound. You just, there's like, a, a, it's this emotional, tender, yet strong tone. And it, it's really, it's captivating. Can I use this as my, as my endorsement on my own? <laughs> I've heard that you guys uh, every now and then uh, swap instruments and kind of give each other a hard time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually well, you, actually, secret... you know, she's a secret bass player, and it's the cutest thing. Sometimes she will take like a bass and she like, like she, that's the. And actually, she's a good bass player. She's she's, she's got. Well, good, I don't doubt good, it. She's got a bass player in her. Um. <clears throat> <laughs> better better violin player, I would imagine, but. Uh, well, I have that. my facility on the violin player <laughs> as a violin player, but. Uh, um, and what's also nice on this album is I, uh, it's the first, the last album had no vocals. They had a little bit of, like, tiny little background vocals. But uh, this album, we're singing uh, on a couple of songs as a group. And then I'm also singing uh, in, in unison with my violin on a couple uh, tracks. Uh, I was going to ask well about that. As but... one song, I'll Wait For You, which ha has uh, English lyrics. And uh, and the lyric is... Uh, sort of simple, but it's done. It's it's said from the perspective of. It's a perspective of um, the source that's speaking always to us. speaking to us. Right. You know, as far as we from it, as far as we cannot think, we can get to. They'll say, you know, "I'll wait for. I'll wait. You will get there. You know, just just saying, you know, you'll get there." Yeah. Exactly. It's a, it's a really have, good song. Have courage, uh, patience. You're gonna get there. 
Hell, I, I, I have a lot of patience. We'll see what happens. MB now, and, and you're happily married, MB. I know that. I saw, I saw you guys. Uh, uh, your acceptance speech at the Grammys. That must have been pretty, uh, pretty. Uh, now, have any of you won Grammys before? Have I ever won a Grammy? No. That's the first. But we've yeah. all played. I actually won a second one, but not just a certificate, just recently for this year. For a guy, Jim Kimo West, who was up against us when we won our Grammy. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, Jim's a friend of mine, so. You won't play on Grammy winning albums, but. <laughs> I sort of won two Grammys, I guess. I don't know how that works. One and a half. And, <laughs> and also, by the way, we've both, well, one of the things to me that was so satisfying about having won this was that we've all been a part of other people's award. Uh, we've we put on MB, countless, you know. countless Academy Award winning uh, film scores and countless like, uh, Grammy Award winning records and right. countless Emmy winning television shows. So having been part of the support team for, for so many of our, of our friends, uh, it was really gratifying to, to have this acknowledgement for us. 100% well-deserved. Yeah, it was some interesting competition. You were up against uh, Lisa Gerard from Dead Can Dance. You were up against uh, Weird Al Yankovic, guitar player. And you were up against uh, the number one Sikh musician in the world, from what I understand. Yeah, yeah. no, it's heavy. And, and uh, you played with uh, the, the other one. Uh, uh, now, you won the Grammy for New Age. I assume all of you are like, we're not new age, but uh, we'll take it. <laughs> we don't know. We said we are the new new age, you know. Well, okay. <laughs> I mean, tell them the, I mean, the story. I mean, actually, we don't, you know, new age yeah. is a catch all, catch -all uh, category that really means nothing except that it's sort of uncategorizable um, in a way. And it's it's been sort of sullied by the, you know, the, the, the meandering, you know, the, 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 the term itself has been sullied by the mandarin twinkling guitar music and stuff like that. I mean, or piano, you know, but there's a lot of really beautiful, emotive uh, music that just has no category that ends up in new age. So that's sort of, uh, you know, if you can suspend your uh, your implicit bias to uh, right. just, yeah, like I say, the people that you're up against are we first we're like, no, we're not, we're not, we're not accepting it. <laughs> oh no, you guys ran up there. I saw it. Then we're like, oh. were, yeah. Twist our arm, all right. <laughs> but it's weird because you guys, I mean, I assume they do that before the main show. Yeah. And you guys were kind of in the back, but, you know, that's where they put the new age people. You yeah. guys Actually, I'll tell you the secret. You go to the back because the cameras find you when you win. And the further you sit back, the longer the cameras are on you. Oh, okay. Uh, no. Intentionally. Now, if you notice, as we're walking down this, we totally strutting down there. You know, we had a couple of our friends playing in the band that was the Grammy band. Right. And they were like, you know, and we were just like strutting down, you know. It was, it was very... You were strutting down, Itai. I know that. I saw that. <laughs> well, I was strutting because I was wearing giant uh, tires on my feet so I could just bounce in my formal dress without having to be in pain. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The weird thing was, we literally had been in the theater. We can, you can, by the way, it's not designated seating. You can sit anywhere you want. So we're going like, well, we should sit next to the aisle just in case, you know. So <laughs> we stood in the aisle, grabbed a seat, because when we walked in, we go, they literally called, okay. And then they had Sangeeta, uh, no, sorry. Um, Sound star category right as we walked in, basically. Right when you sat down. Woman who was playing, I forgot who was that. Anyway, she her band played, and then right after that, they announced the Grammys and uh, our Grammy. And we hadn't been in there <laughs> ten minutes. <laughs> it was really, <laughs> it was really wild. So we're like, so that was pretty exciting, you know. Good thing we got in when we did, though. Mm. Yeah, it's been a little embarrassing. I know. The, one of the things that made me so happy, Mark, is is really oh, yeah. if you listen to the first record, is nothing commercial on it every song is like 17 minutes no lyrics no chorus verse it's pure music from the heart and the fact that it got acknowledged like this the fact that the world said you know that music has meaning has well that mean meant the world to me, you know and not just for me for yeah me. that's what's good about all it all, yeah. the is, all the artists are struggling and work with like doing real stuff and real like and not bow down to whatever commercial stuff and just do what they feel and want so it, i feel it was like validation for all not just us, but like anybody that's doing this, and I felt really good. 
Yeah. Well, that's what's kind of good about, uh, honestly, being categorized as new age, because one of the few places you can buy CDs anymore <laughs> are, like, you know, the, the, the Psychic Eye, the Bell Book and Candle, the Imagine Center, like, places yeah. where they would have that type of music. Yeah. You know, and, it's uh, a little better quality than other stuff that you hear. So, I uh, now, who came up with the with the name? That's what I want to know. Uh, uh, well, I was trying to shop the project, and I kept referring it to it, it referring to it as the kind of music you'd hear if you were in an opium den. Uh, so I just referred to it as the Opium Project, uh, and uh, and I thought that that would be a good name. But uh, it turns out there was already a, a group called the Opium Project. Uh, that looked like they were actually selling opium. They were uh, the Russian mafia selling opium. Kind it of was thing. a new <laughs> oh Russian, uh, rave band, uh, like electronic music band. And they definitely, there was definitely some nefarious activity in that world. Uh, uh, so, uh, and then we were just kind of riffing on it and Opium Moon came. Um, and, and we were struggling with the idea that, you know, we have the opium the the opioid epidemic crisis. and we did not. So we came all of a sudden across this wonderful poem you know, that kind of kind of equated, not equated, but used the opium as a metaphor for freedom, and for pure oh. freedom, which is what we feel our music is representing. It's pure freedom of, of playing and being. So it's a beautiful, I think we put that quote, the quote, and there's actually a really good story with that poem and the, the quote and translation and the guy who did this, you know. So it came zone. from, it came from a poem from, uh, so the poem he's talking about is, uh, it's called She Responded from, a best-selling book called The Gift by translator Daniel Ladinsky. He translated all of Hafiz's poems. Um, so he's a, a best-selling author, beautiful. His, his book has been like a, a staple in every kind of, uh, on the bookshelves of anybody trying to, you know, consciousness, you know, anybody trying to right. is into any kind of poetry. Um, um, and uh, Itai brought the poem to the band and it, it goes. The poem goes like this. The birds' favorite songs you do not hear for their most flamboyant music takes place when the wings are stretched above the trees and they're smoking the opium of pure freedom. I once asked a bird, how is it that you fly in this gravity of darkness? She responded, love lifts me. So that's kind of like a motto, you know. That's kind of how that's the ethos of what we do. And that was basically that helped us because uh, we were we really were, were struggling with you know not wanting to be uh, associated with the darkness of the opioid crisis, which is basically you know, but obviously one of the one about. of the things that's plaguing our country. Uh, right. But we realized that that with the opium of pure freedom. We are basically, it's the antithesis of, it's really the antidote to the greed and, uh, and um, uh, destructiveness of the opioid crises. So uh, that. that's how we justified it. Funny you should say that because we just interviewed Tommy Chong and he said when he was in the hospital, they gave him, um, they gave him morphine and he had, to, he had to tell him to stop because it was just, he was losing himself. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Now I will say that in in the in the in Iranian culture, the Persian culture, Hafiz is just like Rumi. He's from from Persia, which today is Iran. Right. But in their culture, sometimes the opium they look at it as uh, whatever takes away the pain. Right. You know, and so in that sense, uh, whatever brings relief from the pain, kind of stuff. Yeah. So in that sense, I think our music also brings relief from the pain of existence, so to speak. Well, I, yeah, I agree with that. This sucks, though. I mean, I hate to, you know, I hate to put a damper on things because we're talking about love and how great everything is and and uh, poetry. You guys have got to be missing live performance. Oh, seriously, man! It's the that's oh god, yeah. You got this record all ready to go, and I know last time you had this big record release party, and mm -hmm. oh my goodness, mm -hmm. you don't know the half of it, brother. And also, we were planning on having a big record release party, thinking we would, you know we would be able to, um, you know, share the CD and all of that. I think we're going to do a live stream of the album. Um, so we'll do that and we'll do an Instagram live of a few live songs and stuff like that. Um, but in lieu of a party, I think we're going to make Opium Moon masks. Ooh, nice. Oh, I'll buy one of those. When you buy the CD, you're going to get an Opium Moon mask. 
Yeah, and we'll that's, that's uh, kind we'll of figure working out. on that. That sounds oh, right. I yeah, grab it's one gonna of those. be great. It's gonna be perfect, like you know, the whole thing. But it sucks because we have uh, we have dark marshall mass, and I was like, well, I remember like a couple months ago, like in <laughs> May, when you know, basically everybody's like, okay, forget it, we're not wearing masks anymore. I was like, yeah. oh, I guess that's it for the mask sales, and then. <laughs> you know, later they're still they're starting to sell again. Uh, Actually, listen, listen I, I I don't want to make any predictions, but with all the new variants and stuff that's going on, I think the reality is that we we in it for longer than we think. Yeah, I, I think people, you're right. So I think and I think we really need to adjust to the mentality that we have to be way more careful. We can't relax. We can't be like, oh, it's good. Everybody's vaccinated. No, no. no. I think the smart thing to do is to know that we're really in the height of the pandemic still, <laughs> to right. really get vaccinated. And to really be mm -hmm. careful because that shit can move into people who are vaccinated. And it's, it's just good. And for us as live musicians, look, we love playing for people. And we love, and, and the truth is that seeing the Opium Moon show live and seeing that we actually, what you heard on the record is what we play right in front of you. No tricks, no game. It's really what we sound like. Right. It's, right. it's an amazing experience. And we really want to share this. I mean, we know we just, just before the pandemic, we played in India, this big TED show. We had 7,000 7, people just freaking out to our music, you know? And it's like, and going back from this to boom, shut down everything. It's, it's especially with a new record to share, but, um, you know, hang on to your masks and keep pushing them. <laughs> and in fact, can you send the, uh, your contact for production? Is <laughs> <coughs> yes. Uh, I, I, this, this is the same. Part of the show is here. Um, but, uh, MB, how was that playing in front of 7,000 people in India? That's gotta be amazing. Well, <laughs> Not to sound jaded, but um, I played in front of two hundred and fifty thousand people when I played with the Doobie Brothers. So, um, so when you play with who? I'm sorry, the Doobie Brothers. Oh, you play with Doobie Brothers? Okay. And B and B is legendary, man. He's he's been you know he's been in there and done it, man. I, you can't you can't you can't I, out throw him curveballs, man. You got to improve your your Google search. I, I I was trying to find stuff about you. I didn't know you were hanging with the Doobies. Yeah, I played with them for four years, and then after that, I played with Rita Coolidge for five years. And, wow. And then, uh, yeah, and then I didn't tour anymore. I really didn't want to tour much because my kids were young, and um, and then I didn't go on tour again. I mean, it's serious touring until I did that world tour with Game of Thrones Live in 2018, and then I did Josh Groban in 2019, and then nothing in 2020. So that's the way that goes. No one did anything in 2020. Yeah, we, we yeah we didn't do any. Uh, but Game of Thrones, Thrones Live, what I missed that. What, 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 how was that? It was really cool. I mean, you know, it was scenes from the show with the, on a big screen, and then the rest, the other screens, we were all projected up on at different times, all the soloists. <clears throat> and then uh, we were playing like that, like venues like the 7,000, 8,000, 10,000, you know, the arenas. Right, right. Arena. So when we did the Opium Moon show, for in fact, it was hard to tell how many people were going to be there because you couldn't. It was hard to get a sense of this arena. And then it turns out there were like six or seven thousand people there, and it was packed. And it was their big event. They plan all year, apparently, right, Lily, to do this, to do this um, TED talk. That's their one gig. I mean, and then they do the TED talk, and, and I guess they do it every year. There, that's where they do one, and then there, there are TED talks all over the world. And um, so it was exciting because you could hear a pin drop, man. That was what was really weird. There, there was like no scuffling, no coughing, no, you know, talking, no whatever. It's like we started playing. It was like, whoa, this is pretty intense. So that makes it a little bit more intimidating when you get that. But it made it intimate, too. It was cool, you know. It was cool. Yeah, there's there's, there's, a, there's a, some some cough I got the Doobie Brothers show, but that that's a whole different story. Exactly. <laughs> Your whole show with MB, man, he can tell you stories that well, well you know. I got I got a lot of stories, man. <laughs> I got oh, give, give us another one. Come on. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I got the wildest tour story, MB. We got to hear this. I ever read a book about my life. The Doobie Brothers are going to be like four chapters of it. <laughs> so. you know, is, is is this the? Uh, the Michael McDonald Dewey Brothers, or is this the Tom Johnson Dewey Brothers? We did a couple shows with him, but he was gone. He was out. Yeah. Okay. When they broke up in 1983. So, yeah. um, but uh, no, it was great. But like, I've I've been very lucky to just have the work that I got, man. And it's it, you know, I don't take any of it lightly. You're talented, so it's not just luck. Like you definitely deliver. Well, 
Well, thank you. Uh, yes, you have to deliver. At the end of the day, as much touring as Lily's done and all the work that we've all done in terms of like whether it would be a session. I mean, I kind of do a thing where when I play, I don't really, I mean, maybe a little bit, but I don't think I really, I'm, I'm not adjusting my playing too much, my personality that is in my playing, from a session or a live gig. Yeah. Okay. It was different, of course. But when I'm on a session and it's like, here, here's the music, play it, and then go home, that's one thing. But it's still you're bringing your kind of thing to it, your personality to it. And um, and I don't hold back, man. I mean, I mean, I, I will hold back when I need to in terms of volume, but I mean in terms of energy, I don't, I don't hold back. Because um, just to uh, quote a book that I just read, I still give a fuck. But um, so when I, when I get to the point where I don't, then I'm not going to do this anymore. That's, That's a great choice. You know, I can't, I can't do anything half-assed, and I can't. I'm not phoning shit in. It just doesn't work for me. People do it. I understand, and sometimes, you know, they, maybe it's not as exciting as the next thing. But I can't phone stuff in, man. I got, I got to, I got to put my soul into it. And if I don't, it's not. And that's the way. That's why this band is as awesome as it is, is because that's where we're all at. That's how we play. It's. Yeah, you know. that's, we use the Grace Slick model, man. Either go away or go all the way. Yeah, <laughs> that's, and that's so, it. So that, that's your thing is intensity. <laughs> yeah. It's like our lives depend on it, basically. We, we play like our lives depend on it. Well, because it does, actually. And in, in my case, I'm a triple Scorpio, so that might have something else to do with it, too, but I don't know. I'm not, I don't know that much about astrology, but I've been told that triple Scorpio is supposed to be pretty freaking wacky. So. <laughs> well, I, I, pretty I, I, strong I, sign, that's for sure. Yeah, well, Nicole, could you help us out with this? I don't know too much about it. What's that, Nicole? Uh, I, I just said it's very strong. And to be a triple Scorpio means you're incredibly strong. Well, yeah, I guess, yeah. <laughs> so I know I'm a Scorpio. I don't know if I'm, tri I'm a triple Scorpio. We'll have to do our what chart you, some other time, Nicole. Like, All right. Know, but, I'll, yeah. I'll hook you up with the uh, a website that'll do your chart for you. All you have to do is type in your birthday. Oh, yeah. No, I'll you, Nicole. Uh, what kind of you? But, uh, um, but, but uh, since they're here, and B, what, 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 what is, uh, what is the Italian Lily's thing? What, in your opinion, what do they bring to the table? Yeah. Okay. First of all, the same thing: energy. We all, we all bring a similar energy, and I think that's what, that's why this band is what it is. Um, secondly, Lily is way more involved. I mean, just straight up, and and hands on. Like, we got to do this. We got to do that. We got to do this. We got to do that. And um, and have Lily's a fearless leader. She's the taskmaster. So 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 you know we wanted that because she you know she understands the the the, the sensibility of a solo career. Look, I I never until this band. I mean, still even with this band, I'm not a solo artist. I never have been. I've been a side man for people. You know what I mean? And if I'm showing up, whether it's playing with the Doobie Brothers or whoever, or doing sessions, I'm kind of a side man. You know, I'm a studio guy. I'm a whatever. You know, I don't only do studio work, but I'm a I'm a I'm a auxiliary guy person in, in a way. I'm not. I don't mean that demeaningly or anything. Lily's had a solo career for a long time and understands the sensibilities about that. And so there's there's all that. You know, so Itai is Mr. Uh, the Mr. Grounding uh, uh, sort of of a lot of us, <laughs> of a lot of us. So um, and so th that's I mean, and that's that's kind of like there's this nice blend of everything. We don't always all agree on everything. I don't think that's sure. good. Probably maybe maybe it would be good. Um, it'd be easier. That'd be first. That's for sure. <laughs> but um, but um, uh, there's a lot to do. You know, and um, and 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 the brain's always going. You know, and I know Lily's brain is going twenty four seven. So you know that's and and so to to balance all that out and to bring that to the table is like, for example, my whole point of this is like I remember when we did the the Grammy sort of celebration party at the Cafe Largo at the or that. Cornet, the cafe, the Cornet Theater. Um, <clears throat> there had been, I don't remember, there had been some serious political stuff that was going on prior to that. And um, I was ready to kill somebody. And um, uh, uh, we get to the gig, and it's still intense, right? There's still all this stuff going on in the background. But we sat down and played, man. 
and it's super freaking transforming. And every fucking time we play, pardon my English, every time we play, that's what happens. Every time. You know, every we, fucking time? We show up at gigs wherever, and we play for a long day. Working. We show up, and it's like, oh, God, I don't know about tonight, man. And we play, and it's like, boom, gone. So That's great. That means you have fantastic energy. Yeah. I, I can I can relate to that. That's being a performer. I can relate to that. It's just uh, once you get that uh, once you get that feedback from the crowd, um, I think it, you know it puts everything in perspective. You know, it's even more than that in a way, Mark. I think because in a way, um, uh, you know, Khan basically said once that music washes the dirt of everyday life. You know, and I think right. what happens with us to the four of us when we get together, it immediately washes all the dirt that we might deal with, and it immediately puts it in that space. And then I think it puts the audience. So honestly, for us, we love to play for people. But if it didn't, it didn't exist between us, the love of the audience will not make up for it. You know. So it's really, I think, what happens in this. It's it's really four stellar musicians that just put all their ego aside and really push all their love and talent toward each other to make one thing. And that really, honestly, that really is the thing that supported us and carried us through whatever disagreements or friction or whatever we had because. You know, four strong personalities, four strong musicians. It's easy to be volatile. It's easy to, but I think we all recognize the special, the special alchemy that happens with the four of us. And it's really the four of us. Well, it does not work with other musicians. It's not. It's really just the four right. of us. So you know, you can't, you know, you can't change anybody in the Beatles, right? So it's kind of like that, you know. And, right. and also, what's cool is that we've all been around long enough to know how special and rare this is. You know, I haven't had a band in 20 years because I couldn't, like, it. the connection that I had with people, you know, I've had amazing connections with people, but, you know, when you have a, a magical connection like this, it really, mm -hmm. it, you know, I'm, I, I've lost enough, I, I've, I've, I've fucked it up enough to, to know, don't fuck this up, <laughs> this is too right. special. And also, um, uh, we also, at this point, have been, this is not a, these are not records I could have personally made in my 20s. Um, you know, we've all been around long enough to know that just because, you know, the, we, we could, we can all play a million notes. Right. Because, but, but getting together now, we, we have, we all bring this wealth of experience and like knowing that it, it, it this moment needs space. Yeah. I'm not going to play here and I'm going to trust that everybody around me is not going to jump in and crowd me because, right. you know, everybody, we all respect each other's voices and space and sense of timing. And, you know, the whole, the whole, we, we jump into this hypnotic place together and it's really fun. Well, speaking of timing, my uh, green screen just, just fell down. I Perfect saw timing. Oh, yeah. so we have to say goodbye to MB. Whoa. We a rehearsal to go to. Yeah, I appreciate you joining us. What's going on? Oh, look at that. That's crazy, man. <laughs> Yo, I appreciate you joining us, MB. And I know you have to go, but uh, uh, thanks a lot. We're gonna we're gonna wrap up in like five minutes with Willie and Itai. Okay, I'm gonna. I'll let you guys close it out. I'm sorry, I've got to jump to a rehearsal, but thank you guys. This was awesome. And where? Please remind us or everybody where we can see or this or hear this podcast. This will be this will be on YouTube and it'll be on all podcast catchers, and we're gonna we're gonna post it early on the uh, on YouTube and on all podcast catchers uh, this coming Saturday the fourteenth. So. Oh, oh, awesome! Okay, because that it could, if you have a link, I'll, 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 I will uh, tag you and I'll send Lily the link too. Yeah, then we can post that. If it's okay to post that, this is gonna be yeah. on. I'll post everything yeah, except for my uh, except for a green screen falling down. You can post whatever you want. Anyway, um, <laughs> and also Nicole and Mark, anytime you guys, seriously, man, if you want to come out to the studio sometime, I'll show you around. So come over. Uh, we're going to take you up on that. I think we might have a uh, solo show for you uh, very soon. So oh, you want that, man? He's uh, you guys, we're going to get those Doobie Brothers stories. We're going to get all that stuff. Rita Coolidge. We're going to get to hear all about it. Okay, good. I'll go into hiding after that. <laughs> okay. Anyway, love you guys. Hey, I got to jump. I'm sorry. Bye. Bye. Love you, brother. Thank you for being on, MB. All right, thank you so much. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you guys. Okay, bye bye. Bye. And uh, Lily, Ty, I, I had one more question I wanted to ask, and then I was gonna um, the question I was gonna ask. Uh, I know you guys played India, as you were saying, but uh, have you played the Middle East? Because to see somebody from Israel and somebody from Iran, along with a Canadian and a, a somebody from the United States, make beautiful music together, 
uh, it would be uh, it may it makes sure the Middle East crisis. Well, here's what we we said: we would love to do a Middle East tour. We'd love to play Iran and Israel and Egypt and send everywhere and bring our music and a message to there. I think the political atmosphere might not be entirely conducive to this at the moment, but we are ready. So from right. our perspective, our music and, and, you know, in some of these countries, the records are being censored. Some are like, it depends on what kind of cover you have and if they think there's like a subversive messages or whatever. Uh, I think our first record is playing in the Middle East. It's definitely played in Israel and some parts of Iran. I think the next one will too, you know, hopefully inshallah, as they say. Um, but as far as, and I want to use this opportunity to actually mention Hamid one more time, because Hamid wasn't here, but Hamid Saidi, our Suntour player, master from Iran, is an incredible musician and a beautiful spirit and soul. So again, he couldn't be here today, but I want to make sure that we represent him and let him know how much we love and appreciate his his sound and his, 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 his mind and his being in the band, because he's, the, you know, the pillar. And, uh, and just to speak to your question about performing in the Middle East, I've always wanted that. And I've actually, for years- hey, I've played, played in the Middle East for years. Uh, <laughs> he, he grew up in Israel, uh, but uh, I've, I've always had this image of this dream really to really be playing for a sea of people who are fighting each other, who upon hearing the music, they drop their weapons and, uh, and that the music is really a tonic to uh, get people to feel their own hearts and therefore feel each other's hearts and be and make, you know, make love not war. So, uh, I, and that's that's really the intention behind this music, I think. Uh, and we do need this now more than ever. I hope it happens. I hope oh. it happens soon. Uh, I, I hope that, uh, yeah, I hope that first off we can get rid of this uh, pandemic and then we'll see what happens. I mean, uh, you know, I. Like you, like you said in your Grammy speech, you're a you're a band of immigrants. They make beautiful music together, and it's and it's terrific. And I really like the new album. Like you say, it's sensual, it's danceable, it's. I mean, when you say new age, people are like, you know, some wind chimes, wind chimes, you know, in like some weird store. Um, this is this is a you can call it world music, you can call it uh, other things, but it's just it's indescribable, and I really like it. I thank like, you. thank you so much. I like the world music from another world. That's pretty, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I think that was, that's, that's, that's a good description. If you had to put a, a moniker, what would you, how would you describe it? Like if you had to put- Your uh, music? Oh, boy. It's, it, it's a tough thing because it kind of varies from song to song. Um, uh, it's, uh, I think, yeah. It, um, it's not classical. It's not rock. It's not jazz. It's not, uh, um, it's 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 hard to say. It's uh, like I say. I, I think world music kind of probably comes the closest. World music from other other world is a great thing to say. Um, I don't know, Nicole. Let me pass this off to you. You've been so quiet uh, today. Well, I help Lily with her social media, and I found it really appeals to people that like folk music. I think it's kind of like if new age folk was a thing, that would be the best way to describe it. I hope that's not insulting. I'm it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little heavier and dancier than that, though. It's kind of. It is. That's why it's hard to describe. But it definitely, as a person who likes fantasy and gothic stuff, it appeals to me, like as an artist. Okay. You know? Yeah, it has, it has a dramatic flair to it. Uh, yeah. Definitely a drama and a sensuality and a, and, you know. Pathos. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, a palpable depth you know, of, of expression and for, for Renaissance, what? Renaissance world music. There you, you go. Fuck to. <laughs> so Renaissance, world, Renaissance music. world music. You can fuck to. Ooh, That's really you good. You might got something dark Mark. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you could put that on a, you know, on a, on a sticker. We'll quote you. Sticker, yeah. Dark Mark says. <laughs> yes. Renaissance, Renaissance world music. You can fuck to. Nicole six agrees. But, I uh, do. But Lily, uh, before I go, uh, on the new album, I think, uh, is there more violin on the new album than there was in the last one? Or just, uh, I think he stressed out a little more from what I heard. You know, uh, well, the, the, the up-tempo stuff, you know, the danceable stuff, uh, definitely called on all of us to be, you know, a little bit more virtuosic and to like, you know, lay it down and, and take no prisoners. Uh, I think I was probably more, um, 
it might have been a little bit more coy on the first one, even though I did stretch out. Uh, I was, you know, maybe a little bit more ladylike on the first on the first album. Uh, this one, I'm definitely uh, sinking my teeth into it more. That's awesome. Well, I, I uh, once again, we're almost at an hour and a half. I, I could talk to you forever, Lily. And each time mm-hmm. now that I know you, I could talk to you forever. And uh, I, I just, um, I, I we we we've got to go. But I got to tell everybody about Opium Moon's album when it comes out and how people can get a hold of you. Uh, you can find Opium Moon on Spotify. Uh, you can find it on our website, opiummoon.com, uh, on Facebook also, uh, Instagram. Did I, I, I meant to say Instagram first because uh, I'm much hipper than, than a Facebook person would be. Right. Uh, uh, you can find us everywhere. And, um, when does it and come also, out? Uh, and it's coming out August 27th on, uh, through Six Degrees Records, uh, also through our own imprint, which is called Starry Void Records. Starry Void Six Degrees. Uh, and it's coming out August 27th. You can reach us directly through Instagram uh, and uh, and through the website. And uh, if you reach out directly, you can get a, um, a physical CD. And our pre-save link just went up uh, on Instagram uh, today. Oh, okay. Yeah, so go hit up at Opium Moon on Instagram. Uh, and, uh, you know, you guys are one for one on Grammy Awards. It's funny when you go on the Grammy website. It's like one album, one win. Yeah, I, baby. I can see it ha- happening again. Thank I you. Well, they, uh, if any of your listeners are Grammy voters and you want to uh, think about, uh, you want to check it out, we'd absolutely love to uh, you know that. share it with you. And of course, and we're also listening, so we're and we're voting members as well. So feel free to reach out with your own music if you uh, you know if you want us to listen. It'll make up for your Emmy snubs, which uh, I didn't exactly. mean exactly. To... Yeah, yes. fuck them. <laughs> Um, well, actually, since you mentioned that, I just would like to say um, that part of the reason that this music is as uh, spacious and cinematic as it is, is that we all work in film and television. And uh, and this last year, uh, I was uh, lucky enough to score a bunch of uh, film and television, including uh, Netflix's uh, number one hit, uh, Ginny and Georgia, and also uh, two uh, feature documentaries, uh, one of which MB played on and Itai uh, contributed uh, additional music on uh, that was Strip Down, Rise Up uh, for Netflix and Ruth Justice Ginsburg in her own words on Stars, which also came out this year as well. Is, is, That's incredible. Is there a glass ceiling for female scorers? Uh, what was the question? Is there a glass ceiling for free female film score? Uh, there has been, and up till now, f- women uh, film composers have been 1% of the studio projects that have been made. I think we're up to 3 or 4% now, which is, uh, you know, 300% increase, which is awesome. Uh, but yeah, it, there has been, but there's a lot more, uh, a lot more, um, I think, inclusion now and and conscious and, and sensitivity to the need to be inclusive and represent so uh so we're we're being included more and and none and we're just composers you know we're 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 just trying to be you know get be able to pitch get in the room and then let the work for speak for itself right it's all music now before i go and i know it's like your children but uh itai what is your favorite song on the new album you know it is really hard you know to, to answer this i mean i like my favorites now at the moment, I probably will have three at the moment. Okay. So my favorites at the moment will be Dream, Zicker Night, and I'll Wait For You. At the moment. Okay. That could change, you know. You know? <laughs> uh, that's, uh, yeah, I'm with you. And Lily, what, were your, what are your favorite songs on the album? Uh, I, I love them all also. and uh, But I guess uh, for me... Uh, Zikr Knight, and Zikr is a is spelled D H I K R. Right, uh, which, I thought that's what you uh, but uh, pronounce it like Z, like you can say Zikr too. And so like Zikr, and it it means remembrance of God. And for us, it's not an anthropomorphic, you know, right. puritanical God. It's a it's the source. Ge- my mom used to say that God was just an acronym: generator, organizer, destroyer. That's uh, right. And um, and so uh, anyway, I love. Uh, the night 
version, the, the version of Zikr that's on the Night album. And, and we didn't sort of explain this earlier, but there are two themes that we actually played in uh, in an up-tempo way and also in a sensual down-tempo way uh, because it really exemplifies our belief that perspective changes everything. So uh, they feel like completely different songs even though it's centered around the same theme. So, but Zikr Night really is the sensual song that, uh, that and the, the soloing, the playing on it is just uh, just, interplay the rhythm. It's, it's, it's doing the Tokyo it. Moon magic thing on it from it's, beginning to end. It's very passionate. Uh, I love uh, I love the song Messengers, um, mm -hmm. which is deep and cinematic. And then also on the uh, Day album, I love Feast of Sevens, which right. we just did a phenomenal mm -hmm. music video for, which I'll send you shortly. Maybe oh, you, can, you can even uh, do a preview on your YouTube. Oh, great. Uh, I'll send you the link right away. Um, and uh, and then I also love Dream. Yeah. And especially it's solo on it. I think we're all in great. Yeah. And uh, go ahead, Nicole. Hmm? I thought you were going to say something. No. Uh, uh, well, you'll like this question. This uh, is the I last guess one, and then I'll let you guys go. Dream. <laughs> you you got to listen to Dream again. Yeah. <laughs> but one more question before we go. What's it like being in love? What's it like being in love, you know? It just radiates off both of you. So I just, uh, I'm trying to, I, I want to know. It's a, it's a, for me, it's a profound feeling of, of, uh, it's a leap of, profound leap of faith because there's never been, I've never seen it work out, honestly. Right. Uh, and, you know, we're all, we've all been around long enough to sort of, you know, to kind of identify with the cynical phrases, like if it's too, if it seems too good to be true, it, you know, it probably is, or, you know, like, uh, and my mom used to say, you've got to pick which 10 flaws you can live with. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, but the fact that, you know, I, I basically, in order for me to be able to realize that, you know, like, that this is real, and that I can't, you know, that it's the first time I've allowed myself to really be vulnerable and not expected to be uh, crucified for it. Uh, and I still do sometimes, but really it's basically, all right, well, the universe is expanding. There's probably stuff that, you know, like empirical evidence is not, you know, logic is not all there is. I'm just going to take this leap of faith that the universe is expanding and maybe the impossible is possible. And so that to me is what, what this is like. It's, it's very, it's scary, but it's really inextricably linked with my belief in the world, in a way, in 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 something bigger than my own brain. Is that the, will you concur, Ethi, or you have a, a different uh, a different answer? Well, I agree with everything Lily says, and I think love is our original state. You know, so if we're not in love, if we're not experiencing love, it's because we stop it. And we stop it in a variety of ways. We have different names. Well, you know, we call it fear. We call it trust. We call it the, 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 but in actuality, we're stopping our true loving nature. If we have the courage to know who we are personally and love who the person that we are, we have room to love someone else and really meet them in a free way, in a way that doesn't, um, it's not dominating and it's not putting yourself under, but it's really kind of equal. And once that happens, the true joy of life can begin because it's a relationship that's based on mutual love, admiration, respect, and, and friendship and desire to really make each other shine the best and be the best. So even if things don't go exactly the way you want, it's more of a dance and more of a kind of like, oh, how, do we, how are we going to work this out? More like you this and you this kind of stuff. And also I think if we view human evolution as sort of like a wave, I think that the front of the wave, as you know, it's always kind of different things are happening in there. And the, the, the when you do something different, you actually set up new neuronic pathways in the universe to create something. So for instance, if there's music that play like Opium Moon, oh, four people can get together and freely create such beauty. Well, then it's possible, right? So, so people can see this and go, that's possible, I can do this. If people see that people can be really in love and it's not fake and it's actually something that because I, as much as we loved each other in the beginning, we love each other more now and it's better. It was like our sex was great from the beginning. It's 
undescribable now, you know what I'm saying? So, so, um, but it doesn't just happen. It happened because we, we constantly, we, 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 the relationship is priority and it's mm -hmm. priority not on, on account of our personal development or our personal uh, uh, integrity or career. It's, 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 it's something that actually supports it and pushes it. So it's really, I mean, it's, it's, it feels great. What can I say? It feels awesome. <laughs> In a word, great. <laughs> well, well, we'll leave it there. And uh, Opium I Moon, uh, definitely uh, pick up Night and Day on October 24th, if, uh, uh, or at least listen to August it. On 27th, August 27th. Hey, August 27th. Hey, hey. I was say August 27th. <laughs> I, 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 I got so involved August. in love that I forgot. August 27th, stream it, buy it, listen to it. And Opium Moon on all social media. You can check them out on August 27th or October 24th, whatever you want to do. But uh, <laughs> oh, the, the album is August 27th. Yeah, dance to it, make love to it, and let your heart open to it. Yes. And Nicole, you had something to say? Oh, I just wanted to remind everybody to check us out on uh, renegaderadio.com, where this will be airing live uh, next Friday, right, Mark? Uh, actually, it's going to be uh, this Friday. Um, All right, this Friday. And then well, we'll see, I, both these shows went so long. I might just, it, it might be next Friday. It might be this Friday. I'm not sure. We, we've just been talking all day. And that's why I messed up. Well, I was also days. going to say, check out our sponsors, Renegade CBD. At, uh, is it renegadecbd.com? Right. Okay. <laughs> renegadecbd.com. That's with an A. R-E-N-A-G-A-D-E. CBD.com. Nicole Six had some, some gummies, some CBD. She's feeling fine. So you can. And not only that, uh, this music, I'm so glad to hear that actually, because this music is the best music to get high to and make love to. So I love it. Just <laughs> well, I tell you, we, we might have a we might have a renegade radio uh, little uh, package for you guys. So we'll see that. Ah, beautiful. So anyway, Nicole, what a great show. What a great Wonderful. show. Thank you. Wonderful so people. Much. Thank you so much for your time and for great questions and for this forum. We really appreciate being here. I, uh, and Nicole, uh, you're uh, Nicole Six Books on, uh, Instagram on Instagram and H6 on Facebook. Yes, and I'm Goth Comedian on all social media. I can't wait for August 27th when the Opium Moon <laughs> album, Night and Day, including everybody's favorite song, Dream, and uh, is coming out. And, uh, and uh, my favorite, uh, I'll wait for you. So, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Gonna... Thank you so much. Have a great night. So you guys have go. a great night, and everybody have a wonderfully creepy week. Bye. <laughs>